Hello everybody, good to see you. I'm trying to figure out how to get this Zoom video working. I think this should be fine. Ah, they keep changing this. Okay, well anyway, I guess you'll have a very strange view out of the Zoom thing, in the sense that you'll see the side view, which shows you that I actually don't have a blackboard behind me, but just a green screen. It looks like Zoom keeps changing their protocol, but I guess that's okay. So first I want to do a sound check. Is everyone able to hear me? If you're able to hear me, please wave, and then we'll know we can start. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Great. So, uh, oh, nice, nice to see everyone again. I actually, I really enjoy being able to see because then it feels actually the same as if I was teaching a class. I mean, I've, I, I think I've optimized the setup pretty well now in the sense that I sort of look that way. I can see what I'm writing and I can also see right in front of me, there's like a bunch of screens so I can actually see all these people and that way I understand whether or not what I'm saying makes sense. It's just that every single time I do the new call, it looks like Zoom is constantly updating their protocols, which I guess would make sense because like half the world is using it right now. Okay, great. So I want to talk about some more of this extremal set theory. Uh, last time we had some fun with a very unfair set of theorems where we were finding out that just by using linear algebra and finding that somehow with linear dependence, you could find that there were groups of sets which had the same intersection or the same union. So now I want to play on with other kinds of questions that are about sets as well. And these, the, the common uh, theme is going to be that linear algebra is going to be a tool that's very helpful. And one clue that linear algebra is, is helpful is when there are many different ways for an optimal structure to look. So let me start with a, with a, with a, with a very natural question. So here's a question. Suppose I tell you that I have a, set, a family of sets and the sets are all subsets of numbers 1 through n, and I tell you that every pair of sets has an intersection of the same non-zero size. So suppose what we say is you're given a family of subsets of square bracket n, that's the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to n, given this thing, where every pair has intersection of the same size and let's say non-zero size so that it's not as so that we uh, don't have any strange situations suppose I tell you this what's the most number of sets that you could have how many sets how big can the family be Does anyone have any constructions, anything in mind? And here, you see, there's, a, there's not a very specific statement about how big that size is. So maybe you can get bigger families or smaller families depending on what that size is. But what, what would you say? Do you see any particular sizes that you can make? So let's talk about some constructions. Meanwhile, I'm going to see if I can actually turn off this Zoom video. It looks really weird. Okay, maybe it's okay now. I, I never quite know how their protocol works. But okay, good. So uh, what, what do you think? Can anyone think of a construction? The construction will be some number of sets. It will depend on n. Philip. So something like this, up to 1n, and then also, oh, and there's another question, another idea is what about all the sets of size, all sets of size n over 2 plus 1. So I'm just writing all of these things down. Let's start looking at them one at a time. So I want to look at the thing in the yellow first. So this was the idea that you take pairs, uh, I mean pairs to be sets, and then also this big thing. I'm going to try to draw that because to me, I find it easier if I could draw everything. To me, it looks like the one is special in your picture, the yellow one. One is special, and then somehow you have all these sets which are going with the one, like this. And then there's also another set which is all of the other ones. 
So if you look at this construction, let's see, let's double check. So if I take any two of those uh, two element sets, their intersection is indeed of size one. And if I take that big thing against the other one, any of the other ones, the intersection is size one. So that does work. And the number of sets that we have here is, uh, yeah, so, so the number of sets that we have here is exactly equal to n minus one plus one. So we have n sets. So here's one way to get with n sets. Is everyone with me so far? So this is one particular construction. The second one, um, I'm actually not sure the second one works. And the reason is because you need to have all of the pairs to have intersections which are the same size. So maybe I didn't understand exactly what the, what the, what the suggestion was. But it seems to me that sometimes you can have them intersect with like you know small number. And sometimes you can have them overlap with a big number. So I'm not sure that's exactly that that's going to work. Uh, although if you had something else in mind, maybe, maybe it's something else related to this. So I'm going to take this one off. So, so far we have n sets. Is there any other way to do this? I'm sorry? Ah, Kirsten, did you say something else? I, I'm actually... Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Didn't realize it had to be the same one. Right, right, right. Because somehow they will intersect. The things that you gave, they'll intersect. But if we want the same size, it's harder. So we have one of these things which has size n. And that's like a pretty simple, simple construction to draw over here. That seems quite reasonable. Is there anything else that you can do? Ah, empty one, two, three, all singletons. So here I had put this word non-zero. So unfortunately, the, the intersection size of zero we're not permitting. Uh, otherwise, you know, the, uh, 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 that, that was actually the one I was trying to block. So if I allow empty set, uh, then of course it will have intersection size of zero. So that one will not quite work. Is there anything else you can think of? I claim there's something else that is completely different. So this is, these things that you guys are coming up with are very reasonable things that are, you know, things that you can build with your bare hands. It's sort of like if you're drawing a graph, I could draw that graph. But there's also something else which comes from very, very far away. And the hint is, we've seen it somewhere in this class before. Oh, oh, uh, Bryce. Oh, like a cycle. One, two two, three, three, four, all the way around up until n, one. That's a cycle. Uh, there's a thing about this one, though, because the, the, the pairs that are far away will intersect of size zero. And the pairs that are right next to each other will, it will intersect with size once. No, no, this, this is harder than it looks, right? So somehow this is like, it, it's, it's hard to make this one um, if you're, if you're trying to draw it. Actually, the one that Philip gave was probably the lowest hanging fruit in the sense that that's probably one of the easiest ones you can think of. I'm going to say there's something else, though. There's something else we've seen in this class before, and it was used to make a wacky construction. If you think about what kind of constructions we saw in this class, a lot were random, but there was one place that we had a very non-random construction, Philip. Yes. Projective plane. So now if I've got a projective plane going on, um, now I've got sets, and the sets are kind of bigger, right? So somehow each line, each line is a collection of these, um, of these points, right? So what I'm trying to say is that my numbers, my, this doesn't work for all elements, this doesn't work for all values of n, but if n is the number of points in a projective plane, meaning if there exists a projective plane with n points. So a projective plane, if exists one with n points. Now these these are these are not like numbers one, two, three up to n anymore. We're thinking of the one, two, three in bijection with the points of a projective plane. And now each of those lines, each line is the set of points it contains. Now we also know that every two lines intersect at exactly one point. 
Let me draw a picture that shows that this is achievable. So I'm going to use the next screen for that. For the picture, I'm just going to say, let's do the standard Fano plane, which has seven points. And what these points are, are they're like the, it's this diagram where you draw a triangle, you draw the midpoints of the triangle, and you draw the point right in the middle. And now these are the seven points. And what are the lines? The lines are normal lines. as well as the circle, which also represents a line. So these are seven lines. There are seven lines. And if I went and if I had n equals to seven, I could go and look at this thing, and I could say, all right, so I have seven sets. And for example, the set down here is the set of these three particular points. Is everyone following this construction? This is a ridiculously not fair construction. It's like, how could you, how could you have this come out of there, right? If you have a projective plane, uh, by the way, projective planes always have the same number of points as, as lines. So actually, this gives you an n. Uh, because, of course, any two different lines in the projective plane all intersect at exactly, two of them always intersect at one point. So this thing also gives you n. And there are actually infinitely many projective planes. If you remember one way of constructing projective planes, let's just do a reminder. Um, Let's just do a reminder. One way to construct these in general, uh, not th there, are, there are, of course, more projective planes than this, but a way to construct projective planes is with linear algebra also. Projective planes. What you do is you take some Q, which is a prime power. And then what you do is you work over the finite field FQ, three-dimensional vector space, and you say that one-dimensional subspaces of FQ, three-dimensional space, those are points. And if I have a two-dimensional subspace, then that is a line. And at this point, it's straightforward linear algebra. Right? If, if I have linear algebra, well, the number of one-dimensional subspaces is the same as the number of two-dimensional subspaces. You can even think of this sort of like in some sense of duality. But uh, we even counted earlier like exactly how many of each there were. And if I have any two two-dimensional subspaces in a three-dimensional space, they will always have an over overlap of a one-dimensional subspace. So boom, we got that. And, and so there's only, and there's only one one-dimensional subspace in their overlap. OK, so now we know that there are two different constructions. And the two different constructions could not be any more different from each other. One of them is this simple thing that you can draw. Oh, Faye, you have a question. Ah, wait, did you say you have another construction? Oh, oh, actually, well, okay, so, so we'll, we'll get your construction soon because I'm also interested in it. My point I want to make is that we've got two really, really different constructions now. One is something you can draw. One is something you use linear algebra to get. And now I'm curious, Faye, what is your construction? There's another one. OK, wait, so I want to see where this is going. So I see. So if you take this, right? So this is, this is interesting, right? So first of all, Faye is, Faye is greedy. He wants to beat N. <laughs> so, so Faye's idea is he wants to beat N. But if I do this construction, does it work? So here we're saying the complement of every singleton. And if I have any two different things which are missing, yeah, every intersection has size N minus 2. I, I think I like this one. Uh, so if I take any two of these, which are each missing a different thing, then when they intersect, it's going to be of size n minus 2. That seems reasonable. Of course, if n equals 2 or if n equals 1, it's not interesting, but uh, we care about the, the bigger n's anyway. So this thing works. And this also is n. 
Actually, I didn't know about this one before. So I, I, that's why I wanted to hear you know, uh, the, the ideas. Whenever anyone has ideas, it's good. And at this point, seeing these three things should, should convince you that this is a very hard theorem to prove by induction. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to try to use induction to prove this, good luck, right? How are you going to have? How are you going to handle this many cases, all of which could be, uh, you know, the best? Oh, I think I already let the cat out of the bag. The answer is this is the best. N is the best. Uh, there's in fact no way to get more than N, which is why Faye, I knew it wouldn't work. Uh, somehow there, there's a there's a theorem. The theorem is, the theorem is called Fisher's inequality, and if you have this Fisher's inequality, then in fact there's nothing you can do more than N. N is the most, and now we want to prove it. Okay, so now what we want to show is that if you have this uh, family, so given a family F, F of subsets of square bracket N, where each pair has same size non-zero intersection, Uh, okay, it's the same non-zero size inter intersection. It's just non-empty intersection. Uh, what this says is then the number of sets is at most n. Okay. Now we want to prove this. Okay. So I think the first thing we need to do is we need to think about how this could have anything to do with linear algebra. And in fact, the hint was, because we had this projective plane, there's some linear algebra something in here. Because one of these extremal examples is extremal through some, some thinking about linear independence and subspaces. So in that case, we need to use something about linear algebra. Also, there's conveniently an n here. And there's also an n there. And so linear algebra usually has things talking about if I've got linearly independent um, you know, linearly independent vectors, there will, there will be somehow at most n of them. The problem here is it's not quite clear what independence, linear independence, would have to do with anything. Until you realize that intersection of sets is deeply related to inner products. So now, we're not going to work over F2. In fact, this is not a, it's not useful to use a finite field here. But the very interesting observation is, as we have seen so far in this particular unit, in this particular section, what we want to do is for every set, we want to associate this characteristic vector, which has zeros and ones, telling where the set has elements. So what we're going to do is, for each set, consider its characteristic vector. Oops. Over Q. Q is enough. I just want something where I can keep adding. And characteristic vector, what do I mean? What I mean is, for example, if I had to set 2 and 4, that would be associated with characteristic vector 0, 1, 0, 1. Who knows? Maybe n equals 5. I, I guess that was my... Uh, that's how much space I left here, so n equals 5. Okay, so that's my characteristic vector. Now there's something very important. If you take the inner product of any two vectors uh, over the normal Q, the inner product is exactly the intersection size. That's where you have this insight, or where somebody had an insight, that if you do any problem about set intersection sizes, it has something to do with inner products. So now what we know, the, the, the key observation, is that if I have, you know, I guess I need to have some notation or something. But I'll just write it in words. Character, characteristic vector dot product is exactly intersection size. OK, so now once you have this kind of a situation, at the beginning, you, you, it looks like it has a very systematic, uh, it's, it's very systematic. Because for example, if I have any two of these different characteristic vectors, then their dot product is going to be the same. So I, I sort of have, it's not, I mean, in, in linear algebra, you often think about things like, I have an orthogonal set, you know, like an orthogonal set is, or an orthonormal set. An orthonormal set is something where every time I take an intersection, the, sorry, any time I take a dot product, the dot product is zero. Here it's not quite. It's like somehow the inner products are all the same, but they're not zero. And so we'll need to do a little bit more than what we did 
way, way, way earlier in this class when I was talking about like the odd town, even town problem of you know some things with even size intersections. Those were basically just pure orthogonality. Here we have something different. What we have here is that their intersection size is something. Let's give a name for the intersection size. Let's call it lambda. So dot product, and let's call it lambda. This is just going to be for this particular problem. So there's going to be a lambda. I should probably let right above this observation, I, I should say, let lambda be that intersection size. In the given statement of the theorem, I don't know what that intersection will be, but I can say, now I've gotten this system of stuff, let lambda be that intersection size. Let lambda equal that intersection size. Now, actually, this is not completely done, though. What I have here is the, char the characteristic vector dot product between different ones is lambda. But if I take a vector and dot product with, with itself, I don't yet know what that might be. That's, an, uh, that's a very important detail, because if you think about ortho orthogonal or orthonormal sets in normal uh, linear algebra, the reason you know that the biggest orthonormal set is of size n is because the set is also not orthogonal to itself. Like the, 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 I mean, sorry, not, not set, the vector. The vector is not orthogonal, orthogonal to itself. So I do need to know what happens with like, something dot product with self. So here's another observation, or like something to think about. It's what, do, do I know anything about vector dot product with itself? Here's another observation. Uh, let's, let's say each. Each vector dot product with self. Can anyone tell me a fact about dot product of a vector with itself in terms of lambda? Bryce. Okay, so this is, b it's bigger equal lambda, and of course it's less than n. Okay, I'll write and less than or equal to n, less than or equal to n. Okay, now this is true. It's at least lambda and it's less than or equal to n. The motivation be behind what's about to happen next is, well, if I, were, if I had lambda equals zero, I'm not allowed to do that because the problem is not letting me have zero intersection size. And I'm actually also realizing now, I could probably have restated the whole thing allowing zero intersection size, but as long as I don't allow the empty set. Um, that, 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 that we, can, we can talk about that at the end. But somehow the, the way to think about this is, if I have this intersection size as this lambda, and if the dot product with vector with itself can also be lambda, that's not strong enough yet. Uh, the analogy is if I had lambda being zero, if I know that I have a bunch of vectors which are all orthogonal to each other, but I'm, I'm allowing some to be a zero vector, that's not good enough. So in fact, I want to do better than this. I want to do that it's bigger than lambda. The way you do that is with a case analysis. What you say is first, suppose that you have a set which actually has, set ex has size exactly lambda. We'll deal with that case separately. And then after that, we get a greater than. And that's going to be important. So let's see, how do I deal with that case separately? So if there exists a set of size equal to lambda, well, this is not actually that bad, because if I think about what that looks like, I have a set of size lambda, and every pair of sets has to intersect with size lambda. Actually, that means that my entire picture is pretty simple. I have some set of size lambda, and every other set has to intersect this set with size lambda. What does that mean? That means, first of all, that every other set has to contain it entirely. Right, that's true. But furthermore, if I look at what happens to other sets outside, outside, the other sets have to be completely disjoint from each other. Does this make sense? So what I've just drawn is I've said, if there is just one set whose size is that lambda, then suddenly, every set outside has to be disjoint. And furthermore, it has to completely contain that lambda. When you look at this, you say, surely I can use this to prove a bound of like at most n. And in fact, you can. Your bound that you can prove is even better than that. I mean, if you look at this, you're like, well, there's one set, which is the lambda. And then everyone else, in the worst case, has just one more element outside. You know what I mean? So I'm going to write down something, and I'll probably get the calculation wrong. But in the worst case, you have only one thing there, only one thing there. And in the worst case, how many sets do you have? Well, you have the one set for the lambda itself. Plus, and then for each of those other things which is outside, you get one more set. n minus lambda 
sets. Right? Because I have one for the thing itself, and then for each of the things outside, I get one more set. If you add these together, uh, since the lambda is bigger equal one, a uh, lambda is bigger than zero, so if lambda is bigger equal one, then this whole thing is less than or equal to n. So this is one way of proving the result uh, in this particular case. Actually, if I look at this, I'm like, well, how could you actually build this set? Oh, I see. So you can make this construction by saying, take the entry 1, and then take 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5. And so it's sort of like the construction Philip raised. Philip's one was where you took everything outside. And instead here, you just also take that one in there instead. Not also, you take that one inst inside instead. So we've got all these different constructions. OK, but once I've got this, I don't need to worry about this case anymore. And now from now on, every, ve every pair of vectors has a dot product equal lambda. And vector dot product with itself has, has dot product strictly bigger than lambda. And lambda happens to be a positive number. OK, so now it becomes a linear algebra question. So continuing the proof, now I have some vectors in q to the power n, right? And what do I know? I know that lambda is a number which is at least 1. And I also know that any two vectors have dot product equal to lambda, well, any two different vectors, any two different vectors. And I also know that any vector has dot product with itself strictly bigger than lambda. The claim is that this is enough to show that you're only allowed to have at most n many vectors. And this is sort of the stronger version of orthogonality. Uh, if lambda was equal to 0, then this condition would actually already give you there at most n. But here now we're saying it's also true for bigger lambdas. So how might that work? Actually, I'm kind of curious. What would, what would people think? This is no longer combinatorics. This is now like a linear algebra problem, almost like a Putnam-style problem. Like, what would you do? I have a bunch of vectors, and I know something about inner products. Do we have any tools that can hit this? It feels true. Ah, faith. Oh, so you're thinking of using complex numbers, and you're doing like square root of minus lambda to everything. So that that could work. I guess I don't know how to make that happen yet. So I, I'll, say, I, I'll say I don't exactly see how to use the complex numbers to hit this. Oh, this is really interesting. Let me try this. I, I'm kind of curious what happens. And when we do complex numbers, ooh, but there's one thing to be careful. In complex numbers, when you do dot products, you, you have to always take vector times the conjugate. Right? The, the way dot product works in complex numbers is a little bit more complicated than this. Right? So in complex numbers, you basically take the summation of like ci times bi bar. And so I think if you added that, that might actually not do the trick. Because in some sense, actually what you want is that you want that these, when you dot product something with itself, it's not allowed to be 0. That's actually one of the key points. So I think that one doesn't quite cut it. And, and the reason is because for complex numbers specifically, you want that if you have a complex number, that somehow the Euclidean norm of it, you can get by dot producting it, dot producting it with itself, and you're basically getting this Pythagorean style sum of squares. So that one doesn't quite work. Um, maybe this is, this is actually maybe a hard question. So I'll maybe give a suggestion. So the suggestion is, what if we try to find some way to summarize all of this with matrices? You see, when you talk about dot products, it's not clear what you're doing with, in terms of matrix manipulations. However, and, and that's also where, um, in the case of the complex numbers, it got complicated because it's not quite so simple of a matrix multiplication. Instead, you have to do a conjugate also. But if I look at this, I could actually write down some kind of a matrix where I make 
uh, I, I just make all of my vectors, and I put all of my vectors into a matrix and start to do matrix multiplication with it. That's my suggestion whenever you look at a question like this. So let's make a matrix, OK? So I have all of these vectors, and these are the vectors. Each one happens to be one of my sets. So now the vectors have size n, because I have q to the n, but I don't know how many there are. And you know maybe I have a lot of them. In fact, I'm going to draw a picture that's almost for, for sake of contradiction. I have a lot of them. All right. So what I'm going to say is let the matrix A be. It's going to have n things up and down. And I don't know how long it is, possibly quite long. The width, uh, sorry, the width, whatever, the width, the, the horizontal part, this is, uh, this is how big is the set family. Right, the set family was this, cap, uh, this curly F, and I put it across this way. And the way you think about this matrix is that the vectors are running vertically. And of course, these vectors are these standard 0, 1 vectors. Okay, so for example, we had, we had seen there was something which was 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So that's my vectors. Now, how can I use this matrix A together with this information uh, to say something? And here I don't want to use any conjugates because that could get confusing. Um, can someone tell me a statement uh, about doing something with this matrix? I want to capture the dot products. So there's going to be some multiplication. Ah, Tingwei. I wonder what A transpose A looks like. OK, so let's try to see uh, if we have an A transpose. A transpose is going to look like this. It's going to be now tall. And I, I wrote it longer because that's the almost for contradiction. We'll see that something breaks. And then multiply by A. How does this look like? Looks like this. And here are my vectors. And here are my vectors. Good. I like this. The reason I like this, uh, just a second. The reason I like this is because when I multiply these, these are dot products, right? I will take a vertical, a vertical thing and a horizontal thing and put together. So when I do this and I multiply, I'll get what kind of an object? I'm now looking at my dimensions, right? So if I multiply these things together, it looks to me like what I'm going to get is so, yeah, it looks like I'll get something huge. When I say huge, I was just wondering which one is, is it going to be like the long dimension or the short dimension? And in this particular case, it will be the, you know, it will be the other dimension. The other dimension is called how many things are in F. Right, so I will get something which is F by F. OK, and I get this picture. And in particular, oh yeah, that, that also makes sense. Because every single, um, every single entry inside this huge thing is just saying that particular set in F uh, and the other particular set in F, what's their intersection size? And in fact, their intersection size is basically all lambda, with the exception of the diagonal. So all of these are lambda. The diagonal, I don't know. It's not, it's not all the same. Like The diagonal is not all the same number, but every single number in the diagonal is some number which is bigger than lambda. But not, well, I, just, I won't write that because there's not enough space, but I'll, I'll just say that not all of these are the same. The diagonal is not constant. OK, so now I have this, uh, this, this picture of, you know, I've gotten this, uh, this, this long, skinny, uh, yeah, skinny matrix times other skinny matrix made huge matrix. OK. Does anyone have any ideas of what I could do from here? I'm looking to get a contradiction if my matrix is this way, where it's somehow long and skinny across. Right? So I'm, I'm trying to show that this is actually a very bad situation. I'm trying to show you're not supposed to see long skinny times long skinny equals the big version. And we need to use some aspect of linear algebra, something that we can measure about a matrix, to convince ourselves that this will break. Uh, Bryce, what do you see? Oh, 
Oh, okay. So now what you're saying is that this thing over here has non-zero determinant. Uh, so now, now we're just, in, in this game, we go and throw everything we want from the linear algebra to solve our problem. Um, wait a second. So I want to hit that one more carefully. So I don't completely know why yet this has non-zero determinant. Well, okay, it's true. This has non-zero determinant. That's going to be a very important piece of the proof. But why? Uh, and you're saying because you can like subtract some amount from the diagonal, and then you get this all lambda matrix. But I, I guess I don't know how that's a proof yet. You, you're right that somehow this thing has non-zero determinant, and there are different ways to prove it. But how does your proof work? Th that's, by the way, that's the key idea in the proof. Let, so let, let's. So what you said doesn't exactly work, but in fact, all of the things you said are true. <laughs> all right. So, so uh, in fact, you can use the things you said to get a proof. So now let's go into a lemma. The lemma is that something that looks like this has non-zero determinant. For any lambda, it's actually true for any lambda bigger than zero, so any positive real number. Actually, it's also true for any lambda bigger or equal to zero. Let me do that. For any lambda bigger or equal to zero, and this is like even true for real numbers, uh, even real numbers, meaning it doesn't have to be an integer. Okay. If I draw this, uh, what's important is that the, let's just write that the matrix is non-singular. So the matrix, which consists of uh, this all lambdas, except the diagonal, where on the diagonal it's bigger than lambda, not necessarily constant, is non-singular. And now the proof, the first step of the proof is what Bryce said. Bryce said that somehow it looks like you can take an all lambda matrix and add something to it. By the way, a matrix where all the entries are the same is called J. So in, in what we're going to do for this lecture and next lecture and maybe a few more is that the capital J is going to be the all ones matrix. So this is lambda times J plus something else. And the other something that I have is going to be a very special form where I have this, I have the diagonals, the diagonals now, what I have for the diagonals is everything in the diagonal is positive. And I also have 0 off the diagonals. OK, why is this useful? So I now wrote lambda times j. j, by the way, is the all ones matrix. So maybe I'll, I'll note that. So j is the all one matrix. OK. And lambda times this, OK, I've got this sub. Um, if I want to go and prove that this thing is non-singular, uh, you can't use that the determinant of a sum is the sum of the determinants. That's not true. However, there is a certain notion, uh, and it's related to what's called positive definiteness. And this is, this is where the proof is. The, this is the hard part about the proof. It's like it has something to do with positive definiteness. OK, that was a hint. How, how do you finish this? Actually, what's even the definition of positive definite? Maybe let's, let's recall that first. A matrix, let's, let's use real matrices, OK? So a real matrix is positive definite when it's like somehow if you use it to make inner products, you could, in the sense that for any x, x transpose a x is, uh, is always bigger, equal to 0, right? So positive definite when, oh, the matrix has a name. It's called A. When, for any x, any vector x, x transpose a x is bigger equal 0. But that's not the only condition. What I just wrote is the condition for something called positive semi-definite, right? That's positive semi-definite, what I just wrote here. And positive definite, there's one more statement. Does anyone know or remember what's the other statement? Quality holds if and only if x is 0. And you get equal to 0 if and only if x is the 0 vector.
Okay, so this is very important. So this is what this positive definite means. Um, the positive definite comes from the second piece. The first piece is just positive semi-definite. Maybe I'll just make a little comment here. If you stop here, this part is positive semi-definite. Okay, what does positive definite have to do with non-singularity? This is almost like a review of all these linear algebra things. So what does positive definite have to do with sing uh, non-singularity? Or rather, I'll say, a matrix. if a matrix is positive definite, then it is non-singular. So that you can go positive definite implies non-singular. And why? Aditya. <laughs> because all the eigenvalues are positive. Uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Uh, but at the same time, I was hoping for something even more trivial. So, so yes, yes, you can use eigenvalues. So somehow, if you have positive definite matrices, the eigenvalues are all positive. But there's something much easier. Non-singular, OK, what would it mean to be singular? Singular means that there is an x so that a times x equals 0. Use that x. So the singular, then, I mean, again, your proof is fine. But the simple, the simple explanation is, if it was singular, there's a non-zero x so that a x equals 0. Use that x. Put it here. You already get 0 for a x. Don't care about the x transpose. It's 0. And then so you, not, you will not be positive definite. But this also shows that positive semi-definite, you, you could be singular with positive semi-definite. Positive definite is how you know it's not singular. Okay. So I, I will not write that down, but that's, that's somehow this is quite standard that this, this particular positive definite uh, can be used in that way to prove non-singular. So I'll just make that as a, a little arrow that says positive definite is always going to give you non-singular. Okay? So then in our, in, our, in our proof, we will want to show that this particular sum is positive definite. And this is where Bryce's idea comes in handy. Right? We cannot add determinants. You cannot go and say determinant a plus b is the sum of the determinants. However, there's something nice about positive definiteness and positive semi-definiteness. If you add together two positive semi-definite matrices, the answer is also positive semi-definite. And the reason is because if I knew that I had the positive semi-definite condition, x transpose ax bigger or equal to 0 for every x, x transpose bx bigger or equal to 0 for every x, you add together the a plus b and it doesn't make any difference. Okay? So positive semi-definite is, is sustained if you add. Now, something that's good is that j is positive semi-definite. Why is j positive semi-definite? It's because if you try to plug into this thing with a being j, in fact, all you're doing is you're basically taking the inner product of x against itself and scaling it by something. Does that make sense to people? So if I, if I had a j, let, let's, let's quickly do that. Okay, so we're, we're going to do that next. So here's an observation. j is positive semi-definite. And why is that the case? That's because if I went and took proof, if I went and took some vector, which is x, multiply it by the all ones, and then multiply it by the x, what you actually do, you first multiply this like on the right. I, I like that easier. Just take the two things on the right and combine. And what you get is you get you get you still have the original horizontal x. Oh wait, it should be called x transpose. Okay, the original one is x transpose. Okay, and the thing that you're multiplying vertically is just going to be x scaled up by n, right? It's, it's just going to be n times x, because you're multiplying it by the all ones vector. Wait a second, no, 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 that's not true. You don't get that. You get the sum of the elements in x. Sorry, that's important. If I, if I take this x, multiply it over here, then I'll just get the sum of x. So it's just the sum of the entries of x, and it's constant. So everything in here is the sum of entries in x and constant. Well, same for every, all same. Okay, 
So now I have all of these things being exactly the same. And when I have everything exactly the same and multiply it over here, what I'll end up getting is I'll end up getting the sum of all of these entries times the sum of all of those entries. So I get a square. I get a perfect square. Are people okay with that? So I, I add these two things together. If, if I multiply these two matrices together, well, multiply these two vectors, actually, dot producting these vectors, what I get is I get the sum of entries of x all squared. Is that okay? It's just because I have the sum of entries and multiplying it across here, uh, you know, I, I'll just like add up all these entries and scale it by the sum. And the important thing is this actually is bigger equals zero. So now I know that J is positive semi-definite. The other matrix that we were trying to play with was a matrix which just had some positive things along the diagonal. Positive things along the diagonal. Oops, this way. Yeah, positive things along the diagonal. So we're going to add together with that. And that, by the way, is always a positive definite matrix. So there's another observation, which is that if I have a matrix like this, where all of these things are strictly bigger than 0 and everything else is 0, if the diagonal is strictly bigger than 0, this is positive definite. And the reason this thing is positive definite is because if you try to do this um, x transpose times this matrix times x, in fact, what you're getting is you're just getting some combination of the squares of the xi's. And I can actually write that this way. If these entries along the, along the diagonal, if the entries are something like, um, let's just call them lambda 1, lambda 2, I guess they're, in fact, even the eigenvalues, right? So I, I can just use lambdas. These are all lambdas, right? All of these are lambdas. And then over here, this is lambda n. Because if I went and took proof, if I took x transpose times that matrix times x, what I am actually doing is this is just going to be the sum of all the lambda i's times x i squared, right? That's actually exactly what you're going to do. And so if I take this particular sum, well, this is certainly going to be always bigger or equal to 0. It's a sum of squares. And it's not only always bigger or equal to 0. I, because all of my lambdas are strictly positive, I also, have that, uh, I also have that equality condition. And equal 0 if and only if the x is equal to the 0 vector. OK, so at this point, what I have is I have a positive semi-definite matrix and a positive definite matrix. And if I add together a positive semi-definite and a positive definite, the answer is positive definite. That's easy to check. Um, I mean, it's obviously a positive semi-definite, and you just go trace the equality case. So now I, and I know that I have, back to the original problem, I have a positive definite matrix, and so therefore it's non-singular. So this thing here on the right is non-singular. It's positive definite, but it's also non-singular. What's the problem? How do we finish this proof? I need a contradiction. So how could it be that I have like a you know, skinny, like something like this? It's the height is n, the width is bigger, like size of f. And how could it be that I multiply these two skinny things, and I get a non-singular big thing? Uh, what did I contradict? It should make you feel very uncomfortable. Like, this is not supposed to happen. Philip? The rank of the big matrix should be at most n, because the rank of the A transpose is at most n. But there's a rank problem. The problem is if I take a rank of two matrices multiplied together, um, in general, rank of like A times B, that's always, that can only go down. It's at most the rank of A. And it's also the, at most the rank of B. And the reason is because rank is something like, it's sort of like the dimension of the row space, or the dimension of the column space. We could think of it that way. So the rank of this matrix is the dimension of the column space. And if you multiply these things together, what you're actually doing is that you're going to get a linear combination of columns. So every column that I got here in the, in the result is a linear combination of the columns that I started with. Is this making sense? So the point is, if I, if I did this product, you know, I started out with some columns, 
and the way matrix multiplication works, I'm going to be like every single one of these columns is going to be a particular linear combination of these columns where the coefficients of the linear combination are just whatever these numbers were in that first piece here. So the important thing is that when I do this matrix multiplication, every one of these columns is a linear combination of the original columns over here. And if that's the case, then certainly the rank of what I get at the end cannot be any bigger than the rank I started with, because the rank is the dimension of the column space that I end with. And if every column came from taking linear combinations of those columns, I can't get more. I can't get more dimension. So that shows that the rank has to keep going down. On the other hand, over here, I already have a bound on the rank. The bound on the rank for the A, actually in this case I was doing A transpose, but the, the bound on the rank for the A, or the A transpose, is it's at most N, because N happens to be, uh, you know, it's one of the dimensions, right? The thing about rank is it's also the dimension of the column space. So let's write down the whole thing. We'll finish then. So what I get is I get that, you know, on the one hand, the rank of the non-singular thing is F, size of F. So that's equal to the rank of the A transpose times A. Okay. But at the same time, the rank of the A transpose times A has to be less than or equal to, wait a second, how do I want to do this? Oh yeah, okay, that's good, that's good. And that's supposed to be less than or equal to the rank of any particular thing that was in my product. You know, I could write rank of A, I could write rank of A transpose. Uh, this thing, rank AB less than or equal to rank A, is also true that rank AB less than or equal to rank B. And you, to, to do that, you just play with the, rows, the row space instead. But once I write this, the rank of A is also at most N. And it's at most n because of the fact that n is one of the dimensions. So this actually finishes the whole proof, because the size of the set family is at most n. Uh, you could have used this to get a contradiction if the set family was too big, or you don't even need to use contradiction. You can just go and say, look, I wrote down some statement which is true. It's just that I multiply matrices and I have some new thing I made. That new thing I made has rank at most, uh, sorry, that new thing I made has rank exactly equal to size of f. So then you just follow the inequalities all the way across and you get the size of f, the set family is at most n. And that finishes it. So that's actually this proof of this Fisher's inequality. Uh, the, the, the key takeaways are somehow, if you are doing anything with set intersections, it's useful to do inner products. But it's hard to deal with inner products, so it's a lot easier to deal with matrix multiplication instead, at which point your game becomes usually a game of ranks. And if you're playing a game of ranks, then you need to have an efficient way of showing matrices are non-singular. That, actu uh, that actually comes from wanting to add matrices together, which you can't do with determinants, but you can do with positive definiteness. Okay, so that finishes this. Um, do th does anyone have any questions about this? Tingwei. Is there a construction for every abstract matrix that I can use to the minus oh, That's a good question. I was actually curious of the same thing. So <laughs> I, I don't actually know off the top of my head. I mean, if I was looking at this, you know, if I, I know how to, we know how to do it with lambda equals to one. But the problem is as the lambda gets bigger, then somehow it's not very efficient. And so, so what I'd say is that when you try to make one set in the middle and some stuff coming off, that doesn't work. And then the only hope becomes some projective plane type thing where you have all of these different sets which are all intersecting in certain numbers of things. Um, to me, that's the area of combinatorial designs. So the answer is maybe, but I, I don't know enough about combinatorial design theory to give you an answer for that one. And in general, making those kinds of constructions is very hard. Com combinatorial design theory is very hard because you're supposed to come up with all of these different sets, and they're supposed to have certain intersection properties. And oftentimes those come from things like algebra as well. So I don't have a good answer off the, uh, off the top of my head for that one. I was actually curious about that myself as I was thinking about this just now. Other questions? No? OK. Well, in that case, we'll continue next time. So I'll see you, everyone, on Friday.